Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and this is your year ahead astrology and horoscope forecast for Scorpio for the entire year of 2024. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. So your main keywords this year, Scorpio, are health, enemies, children, relationship, money, career, and home. So those are some of the main topics that are going to come up for you this year. You're going to be the most prominent in your life. And I want to spend the rest of this forecast um, expanding on that and talking about which transits correlate with each, with each topic and um, what other different manifestations of those topics you might see come into your life. All right, so here's the planetary movements calendar for the year for Scorpio and Scorpio rising. So the first transit that I was going to focus on is the eclipse series that's going to continue this year in Libra, which is your 12th house, and Aries, which is your 6th house. So the 6th house relates to work and health, and the 12th house relates to things like um, people you don't get along with in your life, which can sometimes be enemies. It can also relate to periods of isolation or even um, actions where we uh, sort of undermine ourselves without realizing it. So with eclipses, they always represent major beginnings and major endings. So it's going to be like the opening of a new chapter of your life for each of these topics. When it comes to the sixth house, um, that can mean, uh, since it's relating to work, like some major new period at work or new beginning at work. Um, for those of you in a managerial position, it could be some sort of new chapter when it comes to somebody that works for you or somebody that supports you in some way. Uh, the sixth house also relates to health, um, especially physical health, whereas the twelfth house can relate to mental health. So this may represent a period where you're putting more attention towards your health than at other times in your life and starting to try new things and open up new avenues of trying to improve both physical health as well as mental health. So some people sometimes, for example, start a new diet or exercise regime um, when they're having major sixth house transits like this. Um, other times with the twelfth house eclipse, people can start um, seeing, a th seeing a new therapist or trying to um, do something in order to become more reflective and in order to work on their internal self while at the same time working on their external physical health. Um, this is kind of a continuation of some themes that already started last year because these eclipses began in 2023, but they'll continue through 2024, um, especially in April and yeah, late March and early April will be the first set of eclipses in these signs, and then there'll be another one uh, later in the year in October, at the beginning of October. So those should be some of the main themes that come up during that time, but the point of it, typically, especially with the health thing, is just um, finding new ways in order to improve your health, both in terms of your mind and your body. And as long as you're proactive, that should actually be a very good thing. Um, the last thing I meant to mention is the 12th house can also represent enemies, so sometimes it represents a new chapter when it comes to dealing with people in your life that you don't get along with and having to take new measures in order to make sure that people who might be undermining you do not go too far or that you put a stop to that if necessary. So sometimes it represents a new chapter of dealing with people that undermine us in our life, as well as sometimes new realizations about ways in which we undermine ourselves and don't even realize it, um, and ways to help improve that in our life as well, which can sometimes be tied in with like um, the mental health uh, sort of fixes that I mentioned earlier. All right, so those are the eclipses taking place there. Um, the other area that I wanted to talk about is some of the nebulous challenges surrounding your fifth house with this Saturn-Neptune conjunction that's taking place this year in your fifth house of children, leisure, and sex and sexuality. So Saturn typically represents um, challenges or surmountable difficulties that come up, and Neptune represents things that are illusory or nebulous or hard to uh, really grasp. Um, and what this represents is the potential for some challenges to come up in this area. So for example, 
some people when they have fifth house transits have issues arise with children where there's some sort of obstacle that they have to work through with their children either in their relationship with them or in terms of um, something happening in the life of your child but with neptune there it may be a little bit nebulous or hard to pin down exactly where it's coming from or what the issue is uh, arises as a result of basically and the tension between Saturn and Neptune especially around the June and July time frame when they're both going to get really close within 10 degrees of a conjun conjunction the tension is going to be um, telling what's real versus what's not real or in other instances it can be a tension between um, doing the ideal thing versus doing the realistic thing and those are going to be some of the tensions that you may wrestle with this year when it comes to that topic either in terms of the topic of children in general or other people's uh, children because it can also work as a more broad topic um, the fifth house also pertains to games and leisurely activities like what you do for fun and you may find some challenges or you may find yourself being a little bit more serious this year when it comes to this topic for some reason this transit actually began last year in march of 2023 so this is a continuation of it but we'll see an intensification of it this year because of the proximity of saturn and neptune and then also do the eclipse later in september that i'll mention in a minute so the other topic that the fifth house relates to is sex and sexuality. So with Saturn going through there, again, you may experience some surmountable difficulties that come up, but there's something that arises that presents an obstacle. Um, and it'll be a question of whether it's a complete roadblock where you can't proceed further with that avenue or whether the other scenario is that it's a surmountable difficulty where if you just put a lot of work and dedication towards fixing it and overcoming it, that eventually you'll be able to you're able to get through that obstacle and it becomes a sort of like what doesn't kill you makes you stronger type situation rather than one that just completely shuts things down. Um, but again, because of Neptune, the core roots of things are going to be a little bit nebulous and hard to grasp. So you may have to spend a lot of time just sorting through like what the actual issues are before you figure everything out this year. Um, this is going to become heightened, as I said, around the September time frame, because there's going to be the first of an eclipse there in Pisces in September, and that eclipse series is going to continue on into next year, into 2025. So that's really going to shine a spotlight on this area of your life starting especially in September, even though some of the things had already been building up prior to that point. Um, the eclipse is just going to make them uh, more necessary to address than they had been up to that point. All right, so that's the fifth house transits this year. Um, the other, I wanted to mention some of the really positive transits you have because there's some, actually some really good ones this year. The two most positive transits that you have this year, the first one is that Jupiter is transiting through your seventh house of relationships and it's going to conjoin Uranus in May. So this transit is good for the entire first half of the year and Jupiter usually represents a period of growth and expansion, but here, because it's conjoining Uranus in your seventh house of relationships, my primary keyword is that it represents a period of unexpected opportunities involving relationships, as well as the growth and expansion of relationships in your life during this time in general. So this is a really good time for relationships. Um, with Jupiter going through the seventh house, sometimes if people aren't in a relationship, they can find themselves in a relationship. If you are already in a long-term relationship, you can find um, that you go into a particularly like a good period for relationships for the entire first half of this year. And this is continuing on a transit that started last year. Um, with Uranus here, over the past several years, um, relationships may have been a lot different than normal or a lot different than previous. And there may be some things about your relationships that are kind of like odd or unique or off the beaten path. And some of those changes this year um, are going to be affirmed or sort of confirmed in some way by Jupiter in a way that should be very positive and sort of growth oriented. So this is one of the most positive transits that you're having this year that I really like because it's generally speaking good for relationships and I would pay attention especially to the May time frame, the April May time frame for um, the, the sudden unexpected potential for opportunities that you should keep an eye out for um, if they come along. 
All right, so that is your seventh house transit. The other really positive transit that's happening this year is that in the second half of the year, starting in June, Jupiter will go into your eighth house of shared resources. So for many people, typically the eighth house represents the partner's finances, and a Jupiter transit through the eighth can indicate a period where maybe your partner has a sudden financial windfall of some sort, maybe they have an inheritance, or maybe you, you're, you yourself have an inheritance, because the eighth house represents other people's money in general, but oftentimes it's the way in which other people's money or resources ends up affecting you. Um, in this instance, because it's a Jupiter transit, it should be affecting you in a positive way um, through growth and expansion in this area. So a raise for the partner. Um, other instances, the eighth house can indicate things like um, debt, taxes, inheritance um, that, with respect to you, um, but all of these should be positive events that happen in some way or growth-oriented events in this area. Um, yeah, so that's, I think, the second most positive transit this year, and it has to do with finances and resources involving other people in your life. All right, so that is that transit. Let's move on to, I think, the Mars retrograde that's happening this year, which is happening in Cancer and Leo towards the end of 2024. And this is happening in your 10th house of career and your 9th house of education, travel, and beliefs. So Mars retrogrades typically coincide with uh, tensions in the area of our life that they go retrograde in. So my primary keyword for this is tensions surrounding career, as well as beliefs, education, and travel. So when you have a Mars retrograde in the 10th house, uh, that sometimes can indicate a period of conflict involving your career, conflict involving your job, or even involving superiors if there's people that are in a position over you. So sometimes these conflicts can um, result in a sort of severing or separation if you decide to leave one job or leave one career and move into another. Other times it can just uh, indicate an extended period of irritation and sort of annoyance with your situation without it necessarily being a big deal. The important point usually is to just exercise restraint so that you don't do something impulsive or something that you might regret in retrospect um, if you had been a little bit more careful. So basically avoid causing problems in your life when it comes to career and these other topics that happen as a result of um, just impetuousness or as a result of anger or irritability. Um, with Mars going retrograde in the ninth house as well, this could involve um, some conflicts surrounding um, education or beliefs. So um, for different people, sometimes the ninth house can represent like one's politics or one's religious beliefs and just views about the world in general. And there's something um, at this time where your beliefs are conflicting or causing you to get into uh, fights or conflict with others. Um, in other more tangible instances, the ninth house and a Mars retrograde transit can mean like um, having a trip where you run into difficulties or issues as a result of travel, since the ninth house is the place of travel in foreign countries, um, as well as just um, getting into conflicts with people that are from a different background than your own is a potential manifestation of this transit. Um, let's see, anything else? Education. Education is the last one that's very relevant with the ninth house. Sometimes that can indicate uh, conflict involving education. Other times it can mean um, severing or separating yourself from an educational path that you had been going down and deciding as a result of some sort of conflict that you have to go a different way rather than the way that you had been proceeding up to that point. So sometimes because it's a retrograde, this can be bringing up old issues from the past rather than new ones. Um, but typically, even if the experience is problematic or negative in some way at the time, typically if it forces you to go in a different direction than you would have gone otherwise, ultimately you'll end up working out for the best and being for a good reason or a good purpose in the long run when you look back on it in retrospect. So that transit's happening the last few months of the year, especially uh, in the November, December time frame, and then it leaks into like 2025 a bit as well. All right, so the last transit I wanted to mention is 
The planet Pluto is moving into your fourth house of home and family and parents and private life. So my primary keyword for this is deeply transformative experiences with home and parents. So um, Pluto is a planet that makes us have some pretty intense, pretty deep experiences sometimes. So sometimes this can involve things with the parents and a period of having experiences with the parents that draw you in and, and cause you to have much more attention on this area than you have at other times in your life. And sometimes we can go things through things with our parents, either based on our relationship with them or based on things that are happening in their lives that can have a, a deeply transformative effect on us so that we go into it sort of one way at the beginning of that transit and we emerge quite different on the other side. So the fourth house sometimes relates to parents. In other instances, it can relate to your home and your living situation. So there may be some major changes that are happening or that are coming at home. And some of these may be a little bit challenging or a little bit difficult. Um, sometimes Pluto transits, both with respect to the home or parents can involve issues of like control, um, issues of like manipulation or power plays or things like that. Um, but basically situations in which you have to take your power back and take power into your own hands and like wield it carefully and ethically as much as you can. Um, but with respect to the home and living situation, some of these um, experiences that you're going to go through are going to have a deeply transformative effect in terms of uh, your home and living situation and just what is happening in your private life. Um, but ultimately, like with the Mars transit, it's one of those things where it may clear the way of some old things, but in doing so, it's going to make way for new things in this area of your life and new experiences that you'll appreciate in the future, but that you couldn't have had otherwise without going through this transit first. So this transit is really uh, getting going next year, and then it's going to last for a while after it goes into Aquarius this year in 2024. So it's not necessarily something that's all going to happen at once, but it's something to pay attention to any changes in this area of your life that start happening next year because they may have a much more uh, long-term impact than you might anticipate at first. All right, so those are the main transits that I wanted to go over for this year. Um, here is a list for those watching the video version of these transits. Here are some of the dates involved for each of the transits that I mentioned. Um, here's the Mars retrograde period. And otherwise, I think that is it for this horoscope for 2024. So uh, for a more detailed breakdown of the transits this year, check out my 2024 year ahead astrology forecast on YouTube. Or for good dates to do things next year, I recently released a report uh, where I went through and I picked out the best dates over the next 12 months for doing things in my 2024 electional astrology report, giving fortunate dates for the year ahead. So I'm doing a 15% off New Year's sale right now, and you can find out more information at theastrologypodcast.com slash 2024 report. All right, good luck uh, in 2024. Have a great year, and I'll see you again next year. All right, take care. If you appreciate the work I'm doing here on the podcast and you'd like to find a way to support it, then consider becoming a patron through my page on patreon.com. In exchange, you'll get access to some great subscriber benefits. You can find out more information at patreon.com slash astrology podcast. Shout out to our sponsor for this episode, which is the Chani app, the number one astrology app for self-discovery, mindfulness, and healing. You can download it on the Apple App Store or on Google Play, or for more information, visit app.chani.com. Special thanks to all the patrons that helped to support the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, shout out to the patrons on our producers tier, including patrons Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Jeannie Marie Kaplan, and Melissa Delano. If you're looking for a reliable astrologer to get an astrological consultation with, then we have a new list of astrologers on the podcast website that we recommend for readings. Find out more information at theastrologypodcast.com slash consultations. The astrology software that we use and recommend here on the podcast is called Solar Fire for Windows, 
which is available for the PC at alabe.com. Use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we recommend a software program called Astro Gold for Mac OS. You can find out more information at astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount. If you're really looking to expand your studies of astrology, then I would recommend my Hellenistic Astrology course, which is an online course on ancient astrology where I take people through basic concepts up through intermediate and advanced techniques for reading birth charts. You can find out more information at courses.theastrologyschool.com. And finally, thanks to our sponsors, including The Mountain Astrologer Magazine, which is a quarterly astrology magazine which you can read in print or online at mountainastrologer.com. And the Northwest Astrological Conference, which is happening both in person and online May 23rd through the 27th, 2024, you can find out more information at norwac.net.